but it's an extract from the writings of the promised Messiah. Yes. I have you got the extract that yes. I have with you? Yes, I have. So please read it first, then you, basing on that, you frame your question. Yes. I've written it, I'll have to read, uh, put the question to as it's written. Yes, please. Uh, in the book written by Hazrat Ahmed called Sitara Kisari, Kisara? Huh? Sitara Kis Kisari. Sitara Kasriya. <coughs> Kasriya. Yes. Hazrat Nizah Kalam Ahmed Kalajani mentions the freedom that people have in religion of religious affairs and advise the government for this freedom. Yeah, he also refutes the beliefs in the death of Jesus on the cross and presents his own claim and, uh, and presents his own claim to be Messiah. My question is, could you please ex expand the connection between the different analogies in this brief gist of the extract from this between, book? Uh, the connection between? The analogies. Analogy of? Hazrat Masih Maud alayhi salatu wasalam with Jesus Christ. Yes. We found him. Yes, yes. I, I understand that. And also another question or just one, one question? Well, there are different languages. Yes, okay. But I can understand. Hazrat Masih Maud alayhi salatu wasalam has written about this in some detail in his uh, book, uh, Nazul al-Masih. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting chapter to read. The fact is that first of all you should understand the phenomena of uh, this terminology as used it's a metaphorical expression. Somebody is given a name which is not his name and uh, the words of similarity are also omitted. This is a figure of speech in every language. For instance, you can say somebody is Shakespeare and you do not uh, use the words of similarity by saying he is like Shakespeare or similar to Shakespeare or near to Shakespeare. But just you say he is Shakespeare. Now that sort of compliment is the highest compliment in this regard, in this uh, um, sphere. And when you add the words of similarity, then something of the beauty of the compliment um, is, it goes out. I mean, this is uh, a lesser compliment if you add the words of similarity. Like if you say somebody is like Shakespeare, that's a very small com compliment as compared to when you say he's Shakespeare. Or if you say somebody is like a lion, that's also a compliment, no doubt. But if you say he is lion, that's much different and much more forceful. So when you use this figure of speech in various languages, it's a common factor everywhere, then you do not have to produce more than one similarity before you use this uh, compliment for anybody. Even just one prominent characteristic of one person is uh, apparently transferred to the other. And when you call somebody a Shakespeare, he does not have to be a British. He does not have to be in shape and figure and other habits like Shakespeare. Nationality is no, not important in this. Any other factor is just irrelevant. Just Shakespeare's importance has to be found. That importance lies in his being a dramatist of the greatest order, of the highest order. So if somebody is a dramatist, that's enough. And it suffices to call him a Shakespeare if he has no other similarity. Similarly, when you call someone Hatam Thai, if that person is generous, even if his tribe is not Thai, even if he is not an Arab, but is an Ajami, and even if no other similarity exists, yet this one singular feature of his being generous is justifies his being called a Hatam Thai. 
So when Ahmed sallallahu alaihi wasallam calls someone in his ummah Masih, first of all you must understand the basic characteristics of a Masih, and if they are present, it is justified to call that person a Masih. What is the differentiating feature? What is the distinctive feature of Masih? That has to be understood. But not only that. In this case, the similar similarities do not end there. They are much more than the ordinary usage of this term in ordinary languages. Even if one particular feature of Masih was present in Hazrat Masih Maudul Asalaamu Salam, it was distinctive in Masih. His being called a Messiah was justified. That is my 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 argument. <coughs> But if you find many other similarities on top of that, then perhaps uh, um, it is so evident that only a blind man, this is the analogy between the two, can miss the analogy between the two. So I begin with the central point. What is Messiah as distinct from other prophets? That has to be understood. And what was the role of Messiah in the background of Judaism? Because first, in, it was the first time in the world among known religions that the term Messiah was used as a prediction, and it was promised that a Messiah would appear among you. His name was Jesus Christ, but his office was Messiah. So this is why I repeat the word Messiah, not Jesus Christ. Jews were expecting someone to appear in the name of Messiah. Although he came and they did not recognize him, because they were expecting him to be of a different nature altogether. But that is not the point. The point is, when he did come, and we believe that he came. Then, what was the distinctive distinctive feature of Messiah who we observe from his life, putting him in a on a different platform from the rest of the Jewish prophets? This is the fundamental question. Once it is solved, the question of analogy will also be solved. As I see it, previous to him. The Jews were permitted to take their revenge, and they were within their rights, of course. But the stress upon revenge and defence against uh, sword by sword was just a common permission to the, all the Jewish prophets who came earlier. So much so that the permission for defence. Became an instrument of torture, an instrument of revenge, and an instrument of atrocity against others, and it lost its meaning and significance altogether when Messiah appeared. It had lost it before. So the Jewish religion became a religion of atrocities and cruelties and hard-heartedness. This feature is repeated after Ahmed. This feature is repeated in the Holy Quran about the latter days of Jew Jewish people. Summa kasat kulu bogum. Summa kasat kulu bogum. This is a verse oft repeated in the Holy Quran in various ways. So, Messiahhood is a remedy for a disease of our people, which in nutshell can be summed up: hardening of hearts, cruelty. Atrocities, transgression against others' rights. This is exactly what had what had happened to the Jewish people before Messiah came. And secondly, the Holy Quran tells us that they refused the authority of Allah and followed their own authorities, that is, the authorities of their religious scholars, and they had lost spirituality. And become had only uh, stuck to form. This was the second nature of their disease. 
So they were to be uh, brought back from form to spirituality, to essence. These are the two major diseases of the Jews which were not rectified previously by other prophets. Even David, even Solomon, peace be upon them, they were permitted to defend their rights with sword. So much so that when you look back in history, they appear to be rather aggressors than defenders. So much sword was used in their reigns that we don't know the crimes of those people against whom they raised sword. They have not been recorded. But whatever is recorded is their glorious victory over their enemies. So the people are rightfully uh, inclined to believe if the Holy Quran had not exonerated them, I mean, that uh, the whole of the Jewish people had become aggressors, even their prophets and kings. So Messiah came to completely reverse the phenomenon. The right, the right which the Bible had given, of course, still lay with the Christians. But he said that out of sacrifice, for the sake of religion, for the name of, 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 of Torah and Moses, we must offer sacrifices and cease to take our right by force. So a complete uh, revolution took place in Judaism, where sword was permitted to be used by the enemies, transgression was transferred to them, aggression became their right, cruelty was left to them, and the godly people were completely disarmed as far as the right of defense was concerned. They were left with offering of sacrifices, offering their necks, offering their properties, offering their homes to be burned, offering themselves to be burnt alive. This is Messiah. Now you read the, the entire history of Judaism. Without except this, you cannot distinguish Messiahhood from the other phenomena of prophets. And this is not all. Sacrifice a long history of persecution, a long history of apparent defenselessness against most powerful enemies and cruel enemies. Yet, progressive victory of the weak against the offender and the powerful, without there being any arms involved in defense. This is Messiah. Now when you look back again to the origin of, of Judaism, that is, uh, let's look uh, start from the time of Torah, you will understand that Hazrat Moses was the first law bringer and it was right from his time that an allegation was being made against him that you are not uh, uh, a rational person, you, you tend to win by force. And the Holy Quran also preserved one of such allegations, that you want to enforce yourself through the means of, of power and, and, uh, and uh, oppression. That allegation continued to build during the following periods in, in Judaism. If Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, had, started, had attempted to defend these prophets by logic, by words of mouth, by <coughs> quoting scriptures and histories and, and this and that, nobody would have believed him. Everybody would have continued to believe that Judaism is a religion of force, it spread through the force of arms, and when um, they were deprived the force, then it ceased to spread. This was the allegation. How could it be refuted through exactly transforming the whole position, whole situation? Now the sword was entirely left to the enemies and sacrifices were left to the people of Torah. They were in fact the people of Torah, these Christians were. 
according to to Christ claim Christ claim himself. So the religion was defended, despite the fact that they were completely poor, helpless, innocent people being um, brought to. I mean, being uh, persecuted from all sides, yet they won ultimately. So if it was soul which won in the first instance, then how it came that in the second instance, it completely soulless people won with the same message. So that established that it was the beauty of message, the force of message from Allah, the help from Allah which had become victorious even in the first instance. Now the, set, the same thing is repeated in our time. To begin with, Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa وسلم, was a law bringer like Moses was. He was similar to him according to the claim of the Holy Quran. He was permitted to defend himself against the sword which was raised against him by the enemies first. And when the atrocities beyond, went beyond all limits, then he was permitted. But once he was permitted to defend, the enemy started talking about a link of the, between the spread of Islam and sword of Islam. And the whole world started talking against him and his followers and the later so-called caliphs but kings of Islam. But Islam is a religion of barbarism and it only can spread through sword and that is the secret of Islam's victory over others. <coughs> Otherwise, message has nothing in it. Unfortunately, this idea was further supported by Muslim scholars. And there are such scholars and some very popular scholars among the Muslims of today who claim that as long as Ahazur sallallahu alayhi wa sallam relied on arguments and spiritual powers, he could not spread Islam among Arabians. The moment he took up sword, then he brought them to reason and to and he forced them to listen to the, the, um, the word of Allah, but not without the help of sword. Look at Maulana Madhuri Sahib, read his Hadith Jihad, and then you'll understand what I mean. So if um, Allah wanted to defend Moses before him, who was not as dear as Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu was, why should he not have defended Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu in the same manner? So as Jesus stood, that is Messiah, stood in relation to Moses, so a Messiah was ordained for Ummat Muhammad as well to bring about the same sort of revolution where soul will be taken away from them, they will de be deprived of the right of defense. Yet left alone and defenseless, they would ultimately become victorious and uh, no persecution would be permitted to eliminate them, rather it would leave them stronger than before. That was the phenomenon of Messiahhood, which was repeated. And we are passing through that phase. 100 years of our, his, of our history is exactly unfolding the history of Christianity, the early Christianity, let us say. And after every persecution, we know we are becoming more powerful and we gain more influence and in, increase in number and in wealth and every uh, quality which is. Uh, um, um, I mean, every, every uh, value which is being robbed from us, instead of being deprived of those values, new values are added to us. This is the phenomenon of Messiah. Persecution, but not with a loss. Persecution with a gain. And this is how we are defending Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through our blood and our sacrifices. It was the Qur'an which won in the first instance. It was not soul. <coughs> now you own the soul, and the Qur'an is apparently defenseless, yet the rationale of the Qur'an, the beauty of the Qur'an, is becoming victorious at every encounter. And the true Islam is, is winning ground daily by, by the hour, in every direction.
this is the fundamental, as I understand, of Messiah. And this similarity is so obvious that uh, I wonder how people can miss it. But there are other similarities. For instance, the time. First of all, the position. Ahzra sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever he mentioned Messiah, his second advent, he said he would come among the Akhreen, the latter days people. And he would also, and through implication, uh, um, we, um, I mean, through um, inferences, we reach also the conclusion that he was to appear on, at the head of the 14th century. When we look back at the first Messiah, he also appears among the latter, latter days people. He also comes at the head of the 14th century. The distant distance between Moses and Messiah is about 1300 years. And this is exactly the case with, with Hazrat Masih Mawdur Distance between Ahadra Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in time and him is 1300 years. Jesus did not bring a new law. In fact, he claimed that I have not come to change a jot of Bible. So Hazrat Masih Mawdur Alaihi claimed that I have not to bring a new law and just I have come to complete it in essence and in practice. And that is what Jesus said. Similarly, the revelation which was given to Jesus, according to the Holy Quran and according to their own claim as well, it is called Injil, Anajil. Do you know what Anajil means? It means Mubashirat, nothing else. Injil means a glad tidings and Anajil is the plural of Injil which means Mubashirat and Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu sallam predicted that Lam yatra min nubuwate illa Mubashirat <laughs> that is Anajil there are so many similarities and the similarities go are further extended not uh, in, in the person of Hazrat Masih Islam alone but in the persons of his opponents as well. Hazrat Rasulullah Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described in detail the age when Messiah would appear. And he himself predicted that his ummah in those days would be like the ummah of the Jews. And he said the similarity would be so complete as one shoe out of the pair is similar to the other part, other 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 uh, shoe of the same pair. So my people, apparently, who are at, uh, who are uh, so-called Muslims, we should say, according to that prediction, they would be exactly, they would become exactly like Jews of Jesus Christ's time, with the hardened hearts and all these qualities of that time have been repeated by Yahya Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he says they would become like these people. So if they have the same disease, the remedy should be the same. That is Messiahhood. So similarity is extended to the whole Ummah. <coughs> because the Ummah would become a people like the Jews, so the answer is the same, Messiahhood. That is the only cure for such a people to bring them back from form to spirituality, from aggression to a, a defenseless sacrifice. So Hazrat Nusim Wasallam has also quoted other example, other similarities. For instance, the empire under which uh, Jesus appeared was a foreign Roman empire. And the empire under which Hazrat Nusim Wasallam appeared was also an extension of Roman Empire. The fact that the British or the Western Empire, the, the, the Western governments are an extension of Roman Empire can be verified by the claims of their own leaders. For instance, Churchill 
in his book on compatriots, uh, the leader, I, mean, I think, uh, I don't remember the name, exactly the title of the book, but that is the book which uh, uh, describes some of his uh, contemporaries, not compatriots, I mean contemporaries, and the title I, I is just this, but in that book, under the title Trotsky, he writes that uh, the Western civilization and the Western political power of today is in fact a revival of the Roman Empire and an extension of the same empire which had lost to the, to the world for a while. So a person no less than Churchill also claims that this is exactly Roman Empire that we see today in a different form. So Hazrat Masih Salam had said exactly the same thing and he's written it in his book that the present government is in fact a form of Roman Empire and under the Roman Empire Muslim Muslims of India were as significant and as small as unimportant as the Jews were in the days of Jesus Christ under the Roman Empire of that time and there a feud started between two factions Jesus Christ was on one side and uh, the Jews were on the other so to defeat Messiah's Messiahhood they uh, concocted certain uh, allegations against him and went to the Roman Empire and asked them to have him persecuted and he was persecuted because of that in fact it was not because of their internal differences they had alleged that he is not loyal to the government and this was the debate mainly which went on before Pilate so Hazrat Musim Salaam and an attempt to my life was made also under the Roman Empire but only I was saved uh, from uh, um, uh, cross or from hanging because of the blessing of Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa وسلم, it is not necessary that every feature must repeat so this similarity is extended also in, also in, in that uh, sphere the government its similarities the position of Muslims vis-a-vis -vis that empire and their state of, of mind and state of heart everything is similar so Hazrat Rasim of the Islam goes on counting certain other interesting uh, uh, features of analogy if you want to know more you better refer to that book I have mentioned but for the time being I think it should suffice now you are the new face eh? so you come first in <coughs> First of all, introduce yourself.